Hi. I'm Michael Endy. 2020 marks the 30th anniversary of JCAST and offers us a chance to look into our rear view mirrors to understand the influences and hear from the individuals whose personal efforts assure the enduring vitality of this annual event. Today's panel consists of five key individuals who are active participants in JCAST from 1990 to the present. Our first speaker today will be Ed Fausti, who is a photographer, printer, and author of the book, A Fragile Utopia, Studios and Spaces at, first, at 111 First Street which he based upon his seven year residency uh, as a studio artist there at 111 First Street. Kay Kenny is a visual artist and a photography professor at NYU. She had a studio at 111 First Street for 12 years and was for many years the president of Pro Arts and a board member from the very beginning. Bill Ryback is a sculptor, a painter, and a graphic artist. He's also a 111 First Street alumnus. He has taught at Parsons and is a former board member of the New York Association of Theatrical Artists and Craftspeople. Rebecca Farinick Sullivan is a visual artist and art educator who served as studio tour coordinator and executive director of Pro Arts from 2005 to 2010. She now teaches at the Pingree School. Christine Goodman is the director of the Jersey City Office of Cultural Affairs and has been producing and presenting art programs here in Jersey City for 20 years. I'm Michael, your moderator. I'm a visual artist, a creative director, and a past president of Pro Arts. We are now going to attempt in 25 minutes to show you 30 years of history. And we're gonna begin that discussion by looking at 111 First Street. 111 First Street was located just beyond the docks of the old industrial Jersey City waterfront it was the, and it was the former home of the Lorillard Tobacco Company. In the late 1980s, the building became a mecca for artists who were priced out of Manhattan and seeking affordable studio and exhibition space. Ed Fausti, can you tell us a little bit about the artist community that grew at 111 First Street? Ed, you might be muted. Uh, this, was, this was one of the early Pro Arts uh, Studio Tour shirts. If you can, any, some people might recognize it. Kay, probably you do. 2003, is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, um, I, yeah, I was one of those displaced Manhattan artists. I lost my workspace in 1999 and uh, tried very hard to find a space, another space, and uh, happened to know some people at 111. And uh, I, I went across the river and took a look and discovered that my nine foot long printing press would fit in the Warren Street elevator with an inch to spare. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't think I could have moved there. So it's one, one artist who said, you know, I think that elevator would work. The other one, forget it. So uh, that, that was the beginning of my seven year time at 111. And I have to say that uh, um, it was really a unique experience. I've lived in, I don't know, an uncountable number of spaces in my life, most of us have. And uh, that one really stands out because, uh, you know, artists tend to be a little bit isolated from their communities, but here we were, every, we were, everyone was a reflection of everybody else. And uh, I, I live in a much more comfortable <laughs> place right now, but I don't have that same uh, quality of life. Um, I was going to open my little talk with a with a with a drama. Uh, it was uh, 2004, I think. 
and everybody was waiting outside of 111 to go into our, I don't know, nth studio tour there. And they, had, they shut the building down. Uh, the, the management shut the building down because they were uh, theoretically starting to demolish things and they were claiming it was unsafe and blah, blah, blah. I don't know what happened behind the scenes, but finally, after a couple of hours and, and uh, practically a, a, an uprising, uh, we, we got to go in and, uh, and start the studio tour. Um, well, I guess it wasn't as dramatic as I made it sound, but, uh, but uh, we would have, I was told that we would average about 10,000 people per weekend of the studio tour uh, coming through there. And when it ended uh, in 2005, uh, it, was, it wasn't just the building we were fighting for. I think, I think you know, Bill, you, you, you may or may not agree, but we felt like Jersey City was losing everything. And uh, in fact, look, look at it now. I mean, it, it, it seems to have blossomed and it's, I think it's terrific that the studio tour reaches into all different neighborhoods. But at the time we, we just, this was so special and uh, it was really like an institution without an administration. <laughs> it was sort of an anarchic institution until we were threatened, uh, until we were threatened by, uh, you know, losing the building, then we had to set up some sort of a political um, uh, uh, structure. But um, I don't know, uh, it's just, just, a, just an uh, irreplaceable experience. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to, or, or if anyone's frustrated that I'm not speaking about the important issues, let me know. Well, well, why don't we move our, our um, questions, if we have time, to the end of that. Uh, that okay. was very insightful there. And I'm going to uh, talk for a moment about the first tour, which was held on October 6th, 1990. At that time, it was called the Downtown Jersey, Jersey City Artist Studio Tour. Bit of a mouthful. And that very first show in 1990 had 70 artists showing. It had 18 different exhibitions going on, and there were 1,500 visitors uh, at that time to 111 First Street for that first uh, event in 1990. Um, those events were organized by Charles Kessler of the Downtown Coalition of Neighborhood Associations and Pat Donnelly at the Gold Coast Magazine. With these events though, you know, Jersey City began to be really viewed as a center for the arts for the first time. Now, also by, by the time 1994 came around, Jersey City was becoming a more desirable place to live. Uh, and the waterfront was in the very first stages of its development. Now, although 111 was facing increasing outside pressures from real estate developers, the artists were more energized by bonding around common interests. And it was in this climate that Pro Arts Jersey City was founded. Kay Kenny, can you talk to us about how and why Pro Arts formed as a nonprofit to address the needs and or rights of Jersey City's visual artists at that time? Oh, it was it was really more about not the tour as much as an energizing uh, connection with the community. We had a lot of different aspects to Pro Arts at that time uh, before it, the tour even became part of it. And one of those aspects was to organize a, an education factor where we would go around to different studios. Uh, once a month, somebody would host and have a talk. Um, we had panel discussions uh, and we met a lot. And the tour wasn't just at 111. We had people who, for instance, Le uh, Leon Yost had his studio open, which was on a different street entirely. There were a few brownstones, real pioneers, people who had come in and started to energize Jersey City and actually were responsible for bringing in 111. And if, if 111 hadn't been um, 
created, there still would have been a huge group of people moving into Jersey City at that time, moving into Brownstones, getting connected with each other. The tour uh, was probably the best thing in terms of creating a community. And, and 111 was obviously the center of all of that. Um, and the tour eventually did have to change. As you well know, it became more and more difficult to have a tour at 111 First Street because 111 First Street disappeared. And the other thing was that it became a huge uh, opportunity for the city to publicize the arts community. And um, it took off on that respect. And actually, it was Catherine Planderman, who was the president of Pro Arts at the time, somebody that Charles Kessler had brought in, uh, Catherine and myself, and one other person who's no longer around, um, the three of us put together a, a package for selling the tour as a citywide process. We got street banners out there. Um, we got um, all kinds of corporate funding and it really started to take off. And within a few years, we had to hire Rebecca because it became overwhelming for us. So this is how, how it all evolved, but we also recognized that because Jersey City was going to lose 111. You know, that was pretty clear at that particular moment in time. Uh, the landlord was pushing hard to get us out of there. Some pretty nasty things happened. I don't know if you remember that, Ed and um, Bill, but wow. Yeah. That, uh, arson, all the other stuff that happened, anything to get us out of that building. It was a terrible time in that, at that moment. And we were all trying so hard, so desperately to keep our, our community intact. Um, so that's essentially- I have one photo of uh, the demolition of 110 First Street, if I, if I could just, from, oh. from my book, just see, uh, it's hard to tell. Oh, I'm not, uh, I'm not on. So, okay, sorry about that. You are, you're, oh. you're on, oh. you're on, Ed. Oh. And, um, and then, and also I wanted to mention, make a, a, a note of the fact that photo that's on the t-shirt that you were displaying in 2003. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, that was your picture. Um, and then the other thing you wanted to know, Michael, I don't know if you want to go on to it, is about Penko. When yeah, we, I would love to do that. So it's with the artists evicted from 111 in 2005, mm -hmm. There was a need for new exhibition space. You know, now this tour had really started to become popular, become very influential. And for it to continue, there needed to be a new space found that was going to be big enough and also welcoming to the tour. Um, so, Bill Ryback, can you tell us? about the first large scale exhibits that were hosted by Canco. And can you also tell us how exactly you managed to convince Canco that this was a good idea for them? Uh, it, it wasn't as hard as you might think. Um, with the loss of, with the loss of uh, 111, there was a period of sort of disillusionment and depression within the art, our arts community in Jersey City. People were in, in diaspora, they were going off to Union City, to Calicoon and Hancock and Poughkeepsie and New Paltz. And, 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 and um, at that point, I decided to join Pro Arts. That's when I decided to join Pro Arts. Uh, prior to that, 111 was like this all encompassing family that was just um, kind of didn't need much more of that. But be that as it may, uh, Pro Arts was the you know this 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 organization that we had a, had a tremendous amount of promise, and uh, um, it was also at that point the only game in town. Um, so I had moved my studio up the up to the heights um, with the company that I was subletting space from, uh, ICBA Incorporated. It could be anything, Warner Barkson's company, and uh, we were in Cancun, and uh, I uh, during that period. I met uh, Natalia Kasatova, the special projects person for, for Coalco, which was the company that owned the whole project, and Misha uh, Kornev, the CEO, uh, in connection with some other projects that we had bid with them. And uh, um, when I, I, I joined the, uh, uh, 
the exhibitions committee, we all kind of had this idea that the, that the, the uh, tour had, without 111, it had sort of lost its, its focus and its, 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 its gravitas. It was kind of diffused all over the city without a focal point. So uh, you know, the, the discussion eventually centered on, on the idea that uh, it would be nice to f find you know, in these, some kind of an industrial scale venue um, that, that could rekindle that sense of, of, of feistiness and muscle and, 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 and grittiness and scale um, uh, that the arts community had uh, and was in danger of. And, and we just could, you know, it, 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 we we're in pretty bad shape at that point. But they, yeah. uh, how did it go? Desperate times to Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. When, when, when you moved it into Canco, um, how did it go for Canco bringing the okay. art exhibition? onto their property um we uh we we, we met the, the committee in, in general the exhibitions committee we met, we, we eventually oh okay going back back backtrack a second um i pitched the idea to natalia kasatova the projects person and uh amazing, they, they were on it in a nanosecond um they were extremely receptive to the idea that we could bring a thousand people through their showroom in a weekend and as it turned out, it was more like a lot more than that. But um, I, th I think um, part of it was th the whole Eastern European ethos of that company. Um, <laughs> it was Kowalko of Zurich, Moscow, New York, and I guess Jersey City as well. But um, they were very receptive to it. And, and um, we were invited, uh, a group of us from the committee, uh, Rebecca was there and Peter Delman and, and, and we went up to their very posh New York headquarters uh, and, and met with, with Misha and, and, and his group. And uh, um, it, it wasn't too long before they, were, they, they agreed to cater the affair and make the space available and help us with the, uh, uh, you know, sheetrocking up new uh, uh, partitions to display work. And, um, uh, Geez, uh, long story short, the opening, we, uh, the, the, the space, uh, the, the, the space, uh, well, we, we had, I think opening night, we had like 1200 people at the kickoff party and, and um, they, they were very pleased, you know, um, both, both, both Misha and, and, and Natalia were, came over and said, well, we pulled it off, you know, and kudos to the committee, to the, to Rebecca, for, for coordinating that craziness, you know, it, it was an amazing project. Um, but the result was we created an anchor. It, it, the, the theory behind it was to create a survey show that would open a month ahead of time before the, the studio tour and um, give people an opportunity to see a lot of work so that when the tour finally opened on the weekend of the tour, they might have some idea of where they wanted to go instead of, kind of wandering around and, and, and following little maps they could first see what they were in for and maybe pick the artist. You know, it, it was the idea of, of um, focusing things, getting people, letting people get to know the artists ahead of time, to, to decide what studios they might want to visit on the, and um, uh, it, it, it turned out to be, be beyond anyone's expectations a rip roaring success and, and and the following one in 2008 was even was even bigger i mean i think we had 1700 people or something I mean, maybe rebecca knows the numbers but uh at, at the at the party uh the kickoff party and and um uh, it, it 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 did it did have that sense of industrial scale and presence, you know, gravitas, um, and, and uh, it, was, it, it, was, it was a joy to participate in. I don't know what else, <laughs> what else I can say. Um, no, well, that's you know, that's and, terrific. I think this is a beautiful opportunity for us to switch to Rebecca, and, and Rebecca, I'd love for you to talk about um, how pro arts evolved, um, you know, bringing, bringing you on board and work to to manage the growth of the studio tour, but also just as importantly, um, if you can discuss the role of the city in helping to facilitate the tour along with um, your organization. 
So hi, everybody. It's good to see you all. I see a lot of familiar faces, which is nice. It's been a while. Um, so how did Pro Arts evolve? Well, we had to evolve fairly quickly because I think that that year, I don't remember, I was looking through old emails, which was a blast from the past, but um, I think we had 600 artists participate that year. Um, I don't know if I'm right, but it was a lot. And there was like 100 shows. That was 2007, I believe. Um, and so we had to react fairly quickly, but the thing was is that we had a really supportive board at Pro Arts. We, the city was very supportive. We had a studio tour committee at Pro Arts, which was Peter Delman, Bill Ryback, Ann Barry, Margaret Weber, Robert Kaczynski, um, and Rosalind Rose, and plus the, the board that, I don't know, it was just like a really incredible group of people that came together. I look back so fondly on that moment. Um, we probably met like bi-weekly um, beginning in March um, up until October for the first studio tour and then again for the next year. So we worked our tails off. Um, they were in it. It was a passion project. Um, and then there were there were lots of volunteers that, that came forward that helped paint. And I just think it was it was it was a work it was a big project done by a lot of people that contributed to it and it was kind of citywide. Um, we had lots of curators that came on board. Gaia curated a show, the guys from 660 Grand. Um, everybody so, can, sort of came together to throw this big event. Um, so, and then there were also lots of financial donations that came in that really helped with the process. Um, local companies like Provident Bank and then like Goldman Sachs and Bank of America. And then local food and wine. I remember Palace Drugs donating a keg of wine, which I didn't even know they made those. Um, <laughs> so, and then they had, you know, um, Love is the Message, LITM donated food and Made with Love. There were so many companies and people from the community that just came together to make this happen, which was just really cool. I think that's how we did it. Um, of course, the city was there. They did a lot too. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we we kind of we did it together, but it was also done on a shoestring, and it was also done sort of. Um, I mean, I was 24; I didn't have a lot of experience, so I remember going down to the city to get like permits for liquor licenses and fire permits and C of O's, and I was just in all new territory. And uh, one quick story: I did get the the uh, the permit, the fire permit, to have the event in 27 2007. And uh, then the event happened and there was like 3000 people there and we had a flamethrower at one point. Somebody was um, making a sculpture with chainsaws outside, um, an aerialist. Um, we had a fashion show, there was live music and open bar for everyone there. Like I, now that I look back on it, it's just like, what? But um, so it was really big and uh, we had all the permits, which I was really happy about. And then, but somehow in the city, somehow there was a, a a lot of miscommunication where the city had the permit, but they didn't communicate with the local fire department near Canco that we actually had received the permit. And so mid event, the fire department marches in with their, all their gear on asking for the permits. Um, and Peter Delman found me and he's like, Rebecca, they're going to, they're going to shut down this event right now. You have to get this. And so I said to him, distract them, give them alcohol. I don't care, but like, just make them stand still for five minutes. And I ran out to my car, which was like parked so far away. And I had stashed the permits in my car <laughs> and I came back in and I showed the permits. And that's just how we did it. It was just flying by the seat of our pants and just throwing it together. I mean, there was a lot of people and we were organized, but in many ways it just was nuts. Um, and so the city, the city sort of like picked up um, all the things that we couldn't pull off. Like they did, they did the maps, they did the poster, they did the website. Um, they were super helpful. They kind of brought the community together outside of Pro Arts. They had the community show um, where anybody could, contrib could contribute art to it. They didn't have to get into a curated show. Um, they helped with a lot of the ADA stuff. Uh, they were they were really there from us for us from like a logistical point of view, um, and it was a good partnership and it was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. Oh. It was a lot of people, a lot of um, a lot of groups of people, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, I think that was that was terrific and and some phenomenal stories in there. Um, I, I think I'd like to switch now to uh, to to a discussion with Christine Goodman. Um, so, you know, as the studio tour it had 
grown so big um, at this time. Um, and it began to really spread across the city. And by, by 2014, um, Pro Arts in the city reached a friendly agreement whereby the Office of Cultural Affairs assumed responsibility for the entirety of the event. Uh, it's grown tremendously in reach and in breadth in the last five years. Christine, under your complete management here, it's a wonderful affair. Can you tell us about perhaps how the first 25 years of history continue and then the evolution of the event to today in 2020? Sure. So, you know, I'll start by saying it's still a huge undertaking that takes a lot of people who care about the arts and care passionately about the arts. And having been on both sides of it, hanging drapes, putting clip lights on at the last second, getting permits, um, you know, I've helped at the production end uh, for, you know, many, many years and, uh, and on the management end too. I think, you know, the, October, September into October is really the time when Jersey City's arts community shines the brightest. You know, we're all sleep deprived. We all have agreed to do way more than we possibly could. And uh, everything really gels at the last second for some tremendous undertakings, whether it's Canco, um, Lackawanna was a huge one, uh, 150 Pacific that uh, everybody came together for, and that was open for an entire month. Um, Tenmark, Tenmark had people building walls and, uh, and oh, I, I remember the cleanup of that space and had to uh, go into making it presentable. So mm -hmm. even up till today, we're still diving in. Uh, we opened the Pathside building to give the arts community an idea of what was inside that space. And we had a lot of projection come into play to uh, build that space and bring it to life. And I think, you know, in these last few years, we've been trying to find a balance between having that, um, that focal point location like Bill was talking about, which is really important uh, for a headquarters space and to be an information clearinghouse and have some really dynamic shows, but also to bring back this idea of a tour to the art and studio tour. Uh, now that this tour, as Kay mentioned, has spread across the entire city, um, you know, with over 150 per participating venues over four days and drawing about 75,000 people engaging with the tour annually in one way or another, um, this idea of how do we connect this massive amount of visitors that are coming in to engage with so many venues in a way that A, uses that, uh, that spotlight location as an anchor, but also still encourages everything we want out of the arts, right? The spirit of adventure, the spirit of discovering new venues and new artists, of connecting the broader Jersey City community, of bringing all of the wards of Jersey City together without overwhelming people. So one of the things that was important to me as cultural affairs director and the team that has been sort of working on the festival over the last few years, COVID notwithstanding, is to find multiple entry points into the art and studio tour. And what that means is different choose your own adventures. So we, so we have our anchors, but we also have curated tours. And the, the curated tour experience has expanded to 20 different tours. Last year, we had uh, buses running regularly throughout the weekend that, had, that were full going on mural tours, but also doing curated experiences, whether they were um, you know, four hours into the west side or um, family-friendly experiences or a curator's choice, uh, LGBTQ plus tour. And these we found have been really well received by people from uh, the community, which is wonderful, and they're community led by volunteers, but also by people who are coming from across the river who don't really know where to start. And so that's been a really good experience and we tend to move away from the curated, uh, the just the shuttle buses because shuttle buses just can't get through Jersey City. 
fast enough uh, to the curated experiences. And also, just one more thing, we also switched the focus, uh, we didn't switch the focus, we tried to push a campaign that really put forward the importance of buying art during Jcast weekend and to remove as many barriers as possible. I felt that was really important when I came into this role. So we did a buy art campaign where we photographed people who had Jersey City art collections of Jersey City artists in their homes to demystify that process and to really put this concept of buying art out in the forefront. Gretchen, who is our art concierge, is sort of the virtual manifestation of that priority, being here to help be that matchmaker through the weekend while we're virtual. And uh, for last year, we were at $96,200 in art sales over Studio Tour weekend. So uh, we would like to keep pushing this idea forward and making sure that people are not only enjoying the tour, discovering new venues, discovering new artists, uh, but also taking that work home with them. And I think that brings us to today, though I think we can always keep growing, always keep improving, and we'll definitely do a survey at the end of Jcast to see what people think and how they think that we can keep making this better. Uh, thank you, Christine, uh, just bringing us to a close. Thank you also, Christine, for all that you and your office do uh, in making this annual tradition um, grow better every year. Thank you to Ed Fausti, Kay Kenny, Bill Ryback, Rebecca Sullivan, all of you, and for the work that you did with Pro Arts. I think that's been a wonderful and very, very fast, uh, just tipping the iceberg of, of of what of this great event's history and thank you very much for watching and participating thank you thank what you. a great thank panel you. I love